What's going on YouTube? I'm Jimmy Kerr and this is the Small Town Collectibles YouTube channel. On today's episode of 10 Questions, I got to interview somebody that it was almost kind of a dream come true and I did my best not to fanboy out uh, during the interview. This person has one of the fastest growing YouTube channels out there. I think they're almost to 100,000 subscribers right now. One of the most down-to-earth people uh, that I've talked to, and you get a real clear sense of why the channel is so successful. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, get your popcorn, and get ready for 10 Questions with Jim Mint Collectibles. Jim Mint, welcome to 10 Questions, man. Thank you for coming on. What's up, Jimmy? Don, how's it going? Good, brother. Good. See, Jim already knows. He knows I've got that good hillbilly name, Jimmy Don. And uh, see, we're, we're already pals. The pre-interview, we became pals, and he uses my full name now. So I feel <laughs> like I'm big time. So, man, appreciate you coming on. So let's just get into it. So question one is, what or who got you into collecting? I would say what got me into collecting I think I had to be eight years old, and it was the 1992 Marvel Masterpiece trading cards. I had seen superheroes before. I remember distinctly, like even younger, seeing that old Spider-Man cartoon where he's swinging from the web, and I used to think, like, what is that web connected to? It's just in the sky, right? Uh, but when I saw those masterpieces, it, something just clicked in my brain. I think it was the way Joe Jusco drew them, like, realistic, and it just kind of popped out of the cards. And what was crazy is like, if you remember these trading cards, and I think you said that you grew up on trading cards as well, oh, absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. So they're all single characters. And, you know, I seen the cards. I thought they were awesome. We would go buy packs. The packs were super classy. They had like a marble look and the black background. Anyway, then one time my friend showed me one of the bonus cards, which was Wolverine versus Hulk, and it blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God, a card i never seen. It's two people it's a versus. It's a bonus card. It had like little shiny kind of elements to it. and I was just hooked ever since then. And what was really great about those cards is on the back, it would show you either their first appearance or their first cover appearance. So I would see cool characters on the card, and I would be like, look on the back, like, oh, man, I want to read about this character. Okay, New Mutants 87 is the first appearance of Cable. Let me try to find that. And I ended up getting, like, the gold reprint, second print back in the day, and I thought it had, like, a key issue. <laughs> now, was there anybody in your family that collected – Nah, man, I'm the I'm the oldest, like grandson, oldest child. Like I'm the oldest. I always, all my cousins and everything and sisters were way younger than me. So my friends across the street were into it. So uh, we would go to this place called the Festival Flea Market in South Florida, and we would just go there with like five dollars in our in our pocket, hit the arcade, walk around. They had a little comic book area, so we would be into like trading cards, and then we got into Pogs, then we got into Ninja Turtles. So yeah, my, my friends, like, we lived in a cul-de-sac, and they lived across the street, and it was just like, that's how we grew up, man. Well, I take for me, I, I think I told you when we first started talking, I had an uncle that would sell. He was a coal miner, got laid off. It was always kind of a boom-bust industry. Mm -hmm. And the one of the last times he got laid off, he had always been into collecting and, and different things, so he started selling to flea markets. And I will never forget this, because I was, like, maybe six or seven years old, and he had taken me to um, – this place to buy this desk, right? It was an old school desk for whatever reason he wanted it. And in the bottom of it were a bunch of comic books and there were some Western books on the top of it. Mm. And he was like, okay, so we bought it. We brought it home and we started going through the comic books. Immediately I did, Well, we dig down in there, man. Yeah. And we find like the second appearance of Spider-Man. And I'm not joking. And he ended up sending it off, getting it graded and sold it for some stupid price. Is that right? Strange Tales book? Strange Tales. And so, like, I just remember looking at that and being, wow, you know, like, this is awesome. And then I had a cousin later. Treasure. <laughs> yeah, right. I found treasure. It was like treasure hunting. It really was. And then later I had a cousin who had a Firestorm book. And uh, and Firestorm, just his appearance, just, I don't know, something about the art and the way that he looked. And, and I was just hooked from it's that clicking. point forward. So, yeah. yeah. That's interesting when you ask me that. Yeah, because I don't have any, I, I didn't have any older influence on me collecting, but I was always like a natural born hustler. Like I always kind of knew that if I want to get something I can't afford, I got to put something together to make that happen. So I was always big on like 
collecting whatever I could. Like I knew a kid that bought Mad Magazines. So I would hunt Mad Magazines and I would sell it to him in order to buy a Nintendo 64. Like I was always not like to flip, like not to buy something and sell it for a lot more, but I just always had that like hustler collector's mentality and that I used to this day. Like I don't want to use my hard earned work nine to five money to buy a collection. So you kind of want to flip it up, you know? Absolutely, man. And it too, it keeps the hobby fresh. And because yeah. that, that was what I was taught to do. I, that's one of my favorite parts of the hobby is, you know, maybe finding something that's undervalued, selling it to somebody and making a little money, but they get something that they love. And then I can take that money and buy something that I love and yeah. you can kind of keep flipping around. So no, that's, I think that's awesome. That's why I don't really agree with the statement that I hear often that say comics are meant to be read. I don't think that's all they're meant to be for, because if that was the case, you wouldn't have local comic shops. These are all mom and pop stores. Comics are meant to be read. They're meant to be collected. They're meant to be hunted. They're meant to be slabbed. They're meant to be bought, sold, and trade. They're meant to be ad adapted into TV and movies. So there's there's so many different little aspects of the hobby, and I, I like to participate in a lot of them. And I think, like you said, that's what keeps it fresh, and that's what brings new people in. And Absolutely. Keeps it fun, man. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. All right, so question two, and I know a lot of people want to know this, and I know why I did it, but why did you, or what inspired you to start a YouTube channel? All right, so um, I got back in the comics around 2014, and I started buying single issues again. Rick Remender had just started the Venom run on with Agent Flash. Dan Slott had just, uh, I think he was midway through his run. It was like when Johnny Storm died, and then he ended up, Killing Spider Man and Superior Spider Man, so uh, and and that's when Spawn was doing all his homage covers. So I, that's when I got into it, and then I found out about CGC. Oh, I, I'm going too far. Then I started going on eBay, and remember the back of those Marvel masterpieces. I started getting those key issues, and I would get them in like very fine. I would say like I'm not going to spend the top dollar, but I'll spend halfway, you know. And I would get a lot of very fine near mint keys, and then I started sending them to CGC. Then I had a lot of good breaks, man. I bought like a raw New Mutants 98 uh, for like $150 on eBay, and it came back at 9.8 around the time it was going for like 450 So I was like, holy crap, you can buy these books, get them slabbed, and then they're worth more. So I started slabbing all the keys. I started selling them all. I started flipping up to big keys, and I ended up getting, man, AF-15, X-Men 1, Fantastic Four 1, Hulk 181. Like I started getting really into it. But I kind of started feeling like it was really like chasing the dragon, man. You get one big <laughs> issue, and it's like, all right, on to the next one. And I kind of started to feel a little over the key issue thing. So then I, um, one time I was in my local comic shop, and I saw the Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 Omnibus. Let me show you what it looks like. I saw this book in my local comic shop. And I was like, holy crap, you're telling me for 100 bucks, I can have Amazing Fantasy 15 and Amazing Spider-Man 1 through 38 with the first two annuals, Strange Tales Annual 2, which is the second appearance, and, and Fantastic Four Annual 1. So the omnibus blew my mind. I'm like, man, all these key issues that I'm collecting, I could have the actual story. So then I started getting into the omnibus game, which started getting me to like, do my research what omnibus are out there i started looking on youtube i saw a couple collectors that had uh crazy libraries i mean riley uh who has the omnibus collectors group and then there would be people like my man gabe loves 90s comics and omni dog and they would do this live show called the omni bros live and I, I would watch that while i was on like an hour commute i used to uh i took a job that was like super far and uh, i had a long commute so i would listen to them and then uh, I started collecting statues, right? Sideshow Collectibles uh, had a Wolverine versus Hulk maquette, which was the same, basically taken from the Hulk 181 cover. So then I started doing the same thing. I started doing my research. I started finding people who reviewed statues. I was learning what was out there. And uh, my favorite one was Cartel from Hell. And he was kind of just like me. He wasn't like your quintessential nerdy guy. He was kind of a cooler dude. He, we talked the same. He had lights in his background and and he was a cool dude i still you know keep in touch with him to this day even though he doesn't do videos but right then i was like i could do this i could i could have my cartel from hell swag the way that i do it but i'm also going to do omnibus content and i just kind of picked 
what I liked about everybody that I watched to form my own thing. I was already gem mint because at that at that time I was already buying and selling on Instagram in order to get these keys, you know. So mm-hmm. I was like, man, I'm gonna do a gem mint style, but I'm gonna drop a video every day. It's gonna be a statue, it's gonna be an omnibus, it's gonna be a live show. Like, and then I just kind of put together basically the the skeleton of what the channel is now. And uh yeah, basically that's what it was, inspired from people that I watched. So the name Jim Mint, was that something that you had used for a long time or how, how did you come up with Jim Mint? That's a good question, right? Because it, it ties into what I was saying. So I was reading the single issues and um, I, I had just submitted my first book to CGC. It was uh, Secret Wars 8 and they came back in 9 too. So I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing then. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I have a friend, my boy Taz from back in my hometown, he would always tell me, he, he was always like up on the new stuff. He was like, man, you got to get on Instagram. He's like, everyone's on Instagram. That's where that's where it's at. So I started an Instagram page. Just I think it was just my name. I would post pictures of my kids, myself, you know, two likes, three likes, nothing. Right. And I stumbled on this um, Instagram page that was like called Superhero Shirts. And they were like, if you send us a picture of you wearing a superhero shirt, we'll post it. So I was like, all right, I, I kind of was in shape at the time. I was feeling myself. I sent them a picture of me in an X-Men one cover shirt and they posted it and it got like 150 likes. And I was like, holy crap. Like right then and there, I knew I was like, man, I need to start an Instagram page. That's just about my comics, my collection. Mm-hmm. So um, I was going to call it um, 9.8 because that was all I really collected at the time was like copper modern nine eights. <clears throat> and I was like, I think I'm going to spell it like N I N E. Uh, and then maybe uh point and then you know e i g h t or maybe i'll do nine p o i n t and then the number eight and i you know i wasn't really feeling any of those and i was like well you know what if i'm going to name it that i might as well just name it the highest grade you could get and just call it gem mint so i i, I made an instagram page called gem mint the logo was taken from a cgc 10 and it was just you know the 10 with gem mint mm-hmm. under it and um and I didn't expect for people to call me Gem Mint. I just thought Gem Mint is the page. But I would post a book and it would get hundreds of likes, you know, Venom 1, Lethal Protector, 9, 8, Gold Variant and stuff. And people would be like, oh, Gem, that's a that's a hot book. And I would be like, Gem? I'm like, why is this guy calling me Gem? <laughs> and I, I at first I kind of thought it sounded like, I don't know, like it wasn't like a tough name, like Gem. I almost thought right. it sounds a little you know feminine or whatever. But uh, I kind of just like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <clears throat> I kind of just owned it. You know, when someone gives you a right. nickname, you know, the worst thing you could do is like try to avoid it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, you need to own it. So I owned it and I just became Jim Mint, man. And it just really stuck. And and the whole time I had the Instagram page, I, I had this plan, you know, for a YouTube channel. And I want I want it to be called Jim Mint Collectibles. Like, I don't know. That just sounded like legitimate because sure. the, the Instagram page was always just Jim Mint. And I was like, man, Gem Mint Collectibles. That's like, if I have a comic book store, that's what I would call it, you know? <clears throat> that's awesome. No, that's a great story. Yeah, I mean, that's that's cool. Because, I mean, honestly, it's a great name. And I always find it interesting how people, like, for example, I interviewed the Nerdy Girl, right? And she said that she didn't make it up. She said when she would go to conventions, people started calling her the Nerdy Girl. Hey, Nerdy Girl. And so it just kind of stuck. And now, like Jim Mint, it's kind of a household name, right? So that's awesome, man. That's a, that's, that is a great answer. All right, so... Question three on Sundays, I know you do a show with your wife Mm -hmm. and has fee, has she always supported you and what you do as far as the hobby is concerned? Well, she's always supported me forever. We grew up together, man. We've been together 20 years. We've been married. um, Damn. Hold on. (laughs) We got married in 2008. Yeah. So, um, you know, at the time, like I, I didn't grow up rich. Like I said, I had to hustle and really flip to always get what I wanted to, to afford that expensive thing. I had to really work for it. It was never given. Right. So um, she really got she really started to understand once I started selling things, because early on 2014, 2015, we were both working. Our kids were younger. Daycare costs more than our rent cost, you know, and it was just like we didn't have money to just be blowing. I would buy like one thing a paycheck. Like once every two weeks I would buy stuff or I would have a bunch of eBay shipments come in, like a bunch of trading cards. And Fee would be like, yo, am I working so you could buy this crap? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, trust me, trust me. So anyway, I, I, when I started selling and she started seeing the hustle part, she was like, oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, go buy your things, you know, whatever, whatever. And she really got crazy involved when we started doing the channel and started doing live shows. 
and she would be a moderator of the chat and she would start building relationships with, with people and see the same names and interacting. And then um, she ended up doing the shows with me. And it, it's like, man, you know, we really took off right around that time. I don't know what mm -hmm. it was, if it was a coincidence or not, but we went from like 30,000 subscribers to 80,000 subscribers when she started being more involved with the channel. So I'll give her the credit for that, you know? Well, I mean, honestly, man, a lot of the people that I've talked to, and it's the, it's the same for me, is my wife same uh, very similar to what you just said she was like why are you buying all this stuff you know and i'm like well just watch trust me and she saw right. the flip and the hustle and the things i was doing uh to make it work and one of the common denominators i found with the people i've talked is they generally have a supportive spouse or somebody who is just not necessarily because my wife is not at all into the hobby like she is the exact uh, opposite of being into the hobby but she loves me and I like it. So it's all good. Right. Cool. And, but I, I found that to be kind of, like I said, a common denominator is the spouses are usually right there with them or just support them in general, you know, yeah. just cool. So, so question four and kind of staying on the, on the family theme, I saw a video on your channel that your daughter had uploaded of some art that she had done for a comic book mm -hmm. uh, that she had wanted to create. And I just wondered, is that something that she really wants to do or has have any companies actually reached out to her to illustrate anything? I, I'm just wondering how that was going. Sure, man. No, I appreciate you asking. So we have two daughters, me and Fee. We have a 13 year old and a 16 year old, and they're both super talented. My oldest, the one that you mentioned, she's uh, really talented. She's really good at drawing and she does it the real way, man. She'll do rough sketches and she inks it and she colors it. And she really nice. is a perfectionist. And our youngest, she's really good at like, uh, creating craft things she makes like plush dolls she made her first cosplay costume for uh comic-con like what is that three years ago already so they're both super talented but they're both teenagers so they're both too cool for school right now oh yeah My yeah lame i'm lame all of us mm -hmm. are lame they're too cool we're cringe so they're not at that point yet where they're like man i need to make some money daddy kind of takes care of them so it's like once they get into that hunger i would like for them to use their passion and their hobby and their talent as their income, because there's no better thing in life than being able to, uh, you know, create a living based off of something you enjoy. So she hasn't done any professional work yet. I wanted her to do my first variant cover, the one that I'm that I have crowdfunding right now. Yeah. I want her to do it. But I think she she even though I feel like she's better than a lot of published artists, she still feels like she's not there yet. She still feels like, hey, I can't really do backgrounds yet. I really um, only do cover stuff. I, I don't really know interiors yet. But I would love for her to get more into it. And as soon as she's ready, man, we got the platform and I have the connections where we could definitely make it happen. Right. That's cool. Because I'm kind of the same way. My oldest daughter is 14. And the word that I use or I get called a lot as a boomer. I also oh, yeah. get called. Yeah, I also get called sus. I just learned what that meant the other day. I, I'm not as sus as I, I was. You know, they're starting to see, you know, because yeah. to them, they're like, Dad, you're 45 years old and you're reading and selling comic books. I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I dig it. Right. So to them, I'm the same way. I'm totally lame. My channel's lame. Everything yeah. you, you, you say that better than I ever could. What's funny is that, um, you know, you know, I, they were here obviously since the start. So I would say, all right, what if I have 10,000 subscribers? Is it still lame? They'll be like, yeah. I'm like, what's the number where it's not lame anymore? Right. They'll be like, if you get like a hundred thousand, then you, maybe you won't be lame. So now that I'm about to be there, they're like, ah, man, I watched Markiplier. He's got like 10 million subscribers. So right? like, yeah. I, th I think that they, they get it. You know, they, they get embarrassed. Like if we, we go out and I have a gem mint shirt or my truck has the big gem mint logo on the back. They're like, ah, you're rocking your own merch. You're so cringe. <laughs> <laughs> I, so like, I, I got to be the, um, the face of it, man. Who else is going to rock it? Right. That's right. <laughs> So, no, I, I find that funny, too, when I talk to people, just like ki having kids the same age. At least, I'm just glad to know we're all going through the same thing with our kids. Right? I do it as well. When I, you know, when I was a teenager, everything my dad did was the lamest ever, oh, so yeah. I don't get it. I think I'm cool, though, just for the record. Right. Yeah, no. So, all right. So, question five. Uh, or Yeah, question five. And I feel almost weird asking you this question now. When I wrote it, it, it seemed good. But now that I've got to sit and talk to you, you're, most, you're one of the most genuine people I've ever talked to. As far as, and I think that really for your channel, that's probably why it works is because the guy I'm sitting here talking to right now is the same dude that's on that channel. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that's why it works. But at the question is, at what moment did you realize that you are a big deal in the collectibles game? <laughs> Well, I don't know that I am a big deal. I still feel like the same guy who yeah. 
or the channel and you know saying hey i guess comment on the video if you want but uh i always tell people that you know you made it on youtube when you start getting haters because when you're new right. and you get your hundred something subscribers everybody loves you everyone leaves nice comments you don't get any dislikes but once you start get, getting out of your comfort zone and you start getting the randoms coming in and they start c calling you names or telling you you're an idiot or you're fat or you're whack or you're this or that and you start getting thumbs downs believe it or not that's when you're on your way and that's when you really made it like i tell my man very gary all the time because i've been i know him before he started his channel and now he's got a really good thing going on and he'll every now and then he'll send me a comment that he gets a hate comment and i'm like dude you made it like yeah I'm happy that you got that well, and that when that first started happening to you, like when you would get a negative comment, like did it bother you? You were like, "Oh my God, I need to change something on my channel." Well, what, even though I may look very confident on the outside, and my wife knows this about me, it always bothers you. I don't care who you are; it bothers me. But what I used to do back in the day, which I thought was funny, and I don't do anymore for the same reason why I did it, is that I I used to be like, "Okay, most channels would just block them or delete them." But I'm going to go back at him. So I would just be like, your mama or something like that. Like they'll <laughs> say, <laughs> One guy was like, or so, I'm sure it was a kid. He was like, have you ever even seen a vagina? And I was like, yeah, your mama's. Like I would just hit him back with the your mama jokes. And uh, it was mad funny. But then I started, um, then I started realizing you really can't feed the the trolls. You know, that's really the reaction they're, they're going for. Right. But. A lot of hater comments have good constructive criticism in there. If it wasn't for a big hater comment I got, I would have never bought this laptop to start editing my videos. I wouldn't have cared as much about the production value if it wasn't for this guy that really ripped me a new one. Now, if people come in and they just give personal attacks, I'm going to just block you without even thinking about it. But I always read all the comments. And even if it might come off negative, like somebody talked bad about the audio the other day and it bothered me. I'm like, I just bought a $400 mic. Come to find out. I didn't have the right mic selected and it was recording off the laptop mic. So you, you really got to look at all of that and, and take what you can from it and try to improve based on those comments. Cool. All right. That's, that's, I think it's a great answer. All right. So question number six is, you know, at this stage in your YouTube career, is it still fun as it was when you started? It's fun, but I would lie if I didn't say you, you, you focus a lot more on the analytics I wish I, I kind of wish I'd never even thought about the analytics, but it probably helped me to get where I'm at. But uh, yeah, it's still fun, man. If I didn't do the YouTube channel, I would still collect comics. I would still buy statues. I would still read comics. So it's definitely fun. And one of the reasons why I really fell in love with comics again back in 2014 was the always looking forward to something. Every Wednesday, there was a new set of books that I wanted to read. So with me, Forget it. I got an arcade one up coming in today. I got a statue coming in Monday. I got new comics on Wednesday. Like it's constantly, I'm constantly ha having things to look forward to. So yeah, it's definitely still fun. I, I I still love doing the channel, but there is a pressure aspect and there is a, a wanting to perform aspect because remember what I said about comics and how it's not just for reading, right? It's for also buying and selling and all those things. Well, the channel for me is another hobby and growing it and nurturing it and watching it do well is another hobby of mine, probably as big as comics are, you know? Sure. So, I no, totally understand that because that's what it's kind of become for me is almost a hobby. Like, yeah, I don't care what you do. It's work. You know, when you do it, it's work, but I, it's fun. And, yeah. you know, and as they say, you'll hear that, you know, that comment over and over, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And there is something you know, to that, because I've really enjoyed, it's just different from what I do every day. And I've learned a lot of new things and it's just cool. And it's addicting, man. I think any content creator will tell you, you always want to crank out videos. There's like an addiction to it, the making of it, the editing of it, the putting it out there, the reception, the performance. So it's a whole other, a whole other drug, man. <laughs> No, yeah, absolutely, man. I feel the exact same way because, I, like I said, man, I've really enjoyed it. I'm nowhere near the level that you are, but it is just a lot. Of, and I never really thought of myself as a creative type. Did you think of yourself as a creative before you started? No, I, I was never a creative-minded person. I mean, when I think about it, I guess semi-creative, but I was always a good orchestrator. Mm -hmm. I always knew how to take this guy who knew how to do that, that guy who knew how to do that, and I, I knew how to wrap it up and present it nice. So I had to learn a lot of those skills on my own. Uh, and, and coming up with video ideas, yeah, I guess you got to be a little bit creative, but I never saw, I was never an artist, you know, so I, I never really yeah. saw myself as a creative type, 
but I, but I guess I guess I must be somewhat, you know. Right. Well, me too, because I never thought of myself as a creative. I'm a numbers right. guy. I can do the same thing that you were talking about. I know how to put people together to get the job done and present it the right way. I yeah. never thought of myself as being creative. So it's a good yeah. outlet to, to learn it and become creative. And the more you do it, the more the better you'll get at it. So question eight or um, excuse me, question seven is with the pandemic, you know, 2020 has just been the craziest year. And has the pandemic, you know, with comic book shops being shut down, and then I'm sure the the companies that you work with, with the statues and and the different things, has that been difficult um, as far as creating new content, or has it made the channel more difficult to you know to do? No, not at all. I mean, when I think about it, there was a break in weekly comics, there was a break in omnibus, a small break in statues, but somehow I still had enough incoming material to do videos with and anytime like i ran out of ideas i'll do a top 10 list or you know i could always you know read a book and review it so i didn't really notice uh me struggling for content i still put out something every day a lot of good videos a lot of big videos that, that performed well and yo man i had my biggest month ever prior to this man and like for some reason i thought my channel would have gone up a lot with quarantine but it didn't like i had a big three months. I want to say it was like February, March, and April. I was doing 10,000 subscribers a month, a million views a month. And then it just woo, it went down. And I think a lot of it had to do with um, the hobby, right? The movie stopped. The movie news stopped. People stopped commuting to work. Uh, people were in tough situations where they weren't really collecting. So I think it, it, it hurt my channel at a, at a time when I thought it was going to really boom. But uh, I, I wasn't struggling for content, though. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I know for me, it's probably what, you know, the conversation with my daughters prompted me to do the channel. But quarantine and as far as my day to day, the way things kind of changed during the quarantine almost prompted me <laughs> to do that. You know what I'm saying? It almost prompted me to do this. And so I never really struggled with it. But that's I always wondered that with the big content creators and the things that you guys are doing, if the if COVID actually affected you. All right. So the next two questions are just kind of things that I, you know, was interested to know. Uh, question eight is, is there a piece uh, in your collection that you regret buying? Uh, <laughs> currently, no, but I actually did a top 10 video on this and it, um, it got like 350,000 views. <laughs> no, oh, no, no. I, think it, I think it got like 280. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the actual, statue that i regretted buying this custom Iceman statue got like three hundred and fifty thousand views there have been pieces that i regretted mostly custom and i don't buy, support custom statues anymore i just stick with the licensed stuff um but in my collection right now there's nothing that i regret and the thing that's beautiful about collectibles even the ones that i bought that i did regret they at least hold and maintain some type of value maybe they decrease a little bit many times they appreciate but they at least hold value unlike I always use the analogy, which is probably a pretty terrible one, but I'm not a big fan of going out for vacations. I think mm -hmm. vacations are the biggest waste of money, paying for a hotel room when you are still paying for your mortgage, you know? So, and, and I always looked at it like, you know, you have memories or whatever, but like you really, that's, you're really blowing money when, when you're doing something like that. With collectibles, I like the whole aspect of them uh, holding value. Yeah. And then you're right, because a lot of times, man, you can buy something, you might think you dig it, but it will hold its value and you can move it and, yeah. you know, get all, if not, you know, most of your money back. And then you can move it on to, you know, something that you do love. Has there ever been a piece that you sold that after you sold it, you were like, and this is question nine, that uh -huh. you sold and you were like, man, I wish I wouldn't have sold that piece. Um, You know, not really, because everything is obtainable. You know, I mean, unless you're selling one offs or like really real true grails. There have been pieces that I sold like uh, a pre-order on and then I, I regretted it, but I ended up getting the piece again anyway. So like there, there are a couple of pieces that I missed the boat on that I don't have right now that I do want. Like I, I really do want the Prime One Studio Batman and Superman Hush, the one third scale statues. Mm -hmm. And I missed out on the pre-order window They're I think they're both sold out or whatever, at least the versions that I want. So uh, I've missed out on some, but, you know, I could I could still get them and I'll probably get them down the line. Cool. So question 10, and this is probably the question that most people want to ask really, you know, really big creators, people who have had success. And I wrote this out, so I'm going to read it. I, I just want to make sure I don't mess it up because I think this is an important question for people who watch your channel, watch my channel, watch anybody's channel. 
So number one, what three things would you say are ingredients for a successful YouTube channel? And since you started, what would you say have been the biggest mistakes you made and what did you learn? Mm, okay, great, great questions. So let's start with the mistakes. What I learned, I had a really hard lesson. And what I would say is um, don't bring on other people to help you with your channel. Don't use guest reviews. Don't don't rely on anyone else but yourself because you have egos. You have uh, conflict of uh, ideas and creative differences. And the only person you can really rely on is yourself or your spouse. So me and Fee, I'm good all day. I, I, I'll never accept uh, somebody to send me a review that they did and I'll put it on my channel. I'll never team up with somebody and make them a partner on my channel ever again. So that was the biggest thing that I learned. And, you know, you have fallouts, man. Like, I see a lot of channels now, three three team guys and stuff. And I just, I always kind of like, man, I hope that you guys could weather the storm. You know, I hope it doesn't affect the friendship. Uh, now, the three ingredients, I think that anybody could have a YouTube channel. I think either you, everybody is either really good at something or they're really into something. And you might not be the best. I'm not the best comic book uh, collector or I don't have the most comic book knowledge but I really, really like it. And I know a little bit about it so I can make a channel about that. Like my father was always a really, really big into fitness and he was always in really good shape. And I used to tell him like, dude, you should have a YouTube channel and just, you know, tell people what you do to get your physique. Like, what do you eat? What do you work out? Do, do buys and tries video Monday and all that stuff. But he never did it, but I think he could have been really successful with it. So I think that you got to have a passion. Either you're good at it or you, you're just a fan of it. And I think the biggest you know, benefit for me was that I was uh, open with not knowing everything. I'll be the first one to tell you, oh, I didn't read that. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. You, know, don't, you don't have to be a know-it-all. You just have to be passionate about what you're talking about. And yeah, with any YouTube video, it should either inform somebody or it should entertain somebody. And if you could do both, that's when you really hit, hit a winner. And I think the last thing is that uh, you got to be yourself, man. People, I told, I think before we started this, I was talking to you. They might come for the comic book, but they'll come back for you. So if you're authentic and if you're being real, you don't put on a front. Be who you are on this live stream as you are on your regular video, and then people will come back for you, for your opinion. You know, I tell a lot of people who who try to start comic book channels, like, if you read comics, you should review them because people are going to want to know your opinion. They could read mm -hmm. the comic for themselves, but if if you present it in such a way that you're being, you know, real and you're giving recommendations, then people will come back. Cool. How, how much? Try to think of the right way to ask this. How much research do you do into what you're buying? Like, do you feel like you know, like the saying is, "Knowledge is power." Because my uncle, you know, I talk about my uncle. The thing that he did that I, that I thought was different than everybody else is he knew everything about what he was selling. I mean, like he would read constantly. He was always up to date on what was going on. How important to you or in your success has been really knowing your product and knowing what you're, what you're you know, reviewing? Yeah. You can't be successful without it. Remember when I mentioned when I first got into Omnibus, what did I do? I started watching every YouTube video on Omnibus to, known to man. Then with statues as well. I built my collection off dealing CGC key issues. So in order to do that, you had to learn that market. What's hot? What sells? What doesn't sell? First of all, DC key books. I'm sorry. They don't sell. Marvel keys or things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm at the point now where it's second hand. But at first, I had to learn. I made mistakes. I learned from my mistakes. And I would just do a lot of research. Like my comic book key issue knowledge. Yo, the CGC forums. I, I'm a a student of that school that school taught me everything i knew about grading books raw books and i'm not the best grader but i you know i can get by uh key issues uh you know slabbing you know what to look for things like that so you have to man you have to really do your research i'm at the point now where i don't really have to do that as much i'm kind of already in the thick of what i do uh but you know you still always learn by by watching other people or or just you know keeping your ear to the streets as far as what's going on in, in, in the hobby as a whole. Let me ask you this, something I noticed by watching your videos, and it's actually something that I struggle with myself, is taking my time, mm. okay? And a lot of times, like, you know, you're doing the video, especially when you first start, it's almost like, okay, I just want to get this done, you know, because you're nervous or whatever the reason is, you know, your first time in front of the camera. One of the things I noticed watching your video 
is you really take the time, especially with the statues, and you really kind of talk about the detail um, and really kind of go through it. It's actually, you learn a lot about how the sculpt was made. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Did, was that something that you were always just kind of good at? Or is that something that developed over time as well? Because that's really for me, and that's why I'm asking the question, for me, that's been one of my biggest struggles. It's just mm. taking my time. It's funny that you say that because I feel like I I personally feel like it's the other way around. Like if you look at my old um, statue videos, there was no editing. They would be 30 minute videos. Mm -hmm. Now I try to really condense all that into eight to 10 minutes. And I just I know in my head how long my intro is going to be about. I know the unboxing part's going to be this. The assembly is going to be this. And then the review is going to be that. I really just want to hit that sweet spot that YouTube seems to love, which is now eight to 10 minutes. It used to be just 10 minutes. Um I don't know. It's just I have always been into the details, even in those. That's why those long videos were so long, because it's a mm -hmm. lot of going over the scope, going over the paint, the things that you do like, things that you don't like. And although it seems like I'm taking my time, if you look at the statue videos, they're really only 10 minutes long. I mean, unless they're like those huge ones that take forever. But right. uh, it, well, it was all about, though, refining that that process with editing and stuff like that, that really helped me do what I was already doing in, in a more condensed video. Yeah, no, it's one of the things, I guess the editing is part of it, you know, and that's one of the things I've had fun learning is the edit part. Mm -hmm. And even with the edit, like I, if I would edit my down, it'd be five minutes long because I just went too quickly. And a lot of times when I'm watching yours, because you are able to take, yeah, you edit it down, but it is when you're talking about the pieces themselves, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a very detailed look at the piece. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, like I said, it just kind of works. And that was something for me I've struggled with. And I was just kind of wondering how you work through it. Yeah, no, and I think a lot of that has to do with the the medium. The statue, it, 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 it lends yourself to that because you're really taking it in. And I'm looking at it in person for the first time. So I'm taking it in. I'm kind of describing what I'm seeing. But I notice when I do um, like omnibus reviews, it's a little bit different. I'm going more off memory and what I just read 30 issues of. And that could be a little bit more difficult. Uh, or even with weekly comic book reviews. Now, those uh, it tends to be a little bit longer because it's so many books. So right. I'm only probably talking about each book for 30 seconds, but you know, there's so many books, but uh, yeah, that might be something you need to statue reviews, at least for me. No, yeah, that's cool. Brother, that wraps up the 10 questions, man. Uh, I had a great time. I hope you did too. And you know, for all the people out there watching, it's, we all know where Jim Mint's at. Go subscribe. He's almost to a hundred thousand subscribers uh, and got some cool giveaways going on. Oh man. Yeah. Like you said, we're, we're, uh, we're about, less than 2000 away from 100 K. So we're doing a huge giveaway. Uh, I just confirmed with XM studios yesterday, they're going to be donating their Joker, uh, Orochi statue, which is a humongous nice. samurai Joker, uh, sideshow collectible sent us a hot toys, nano gauntlet figurama sent us a, a one six scale diorama. We, we're going to have 10 huge gifts and all you have to do is be subscribed and comment on as many videos, because when we hit the 100 K we'll do a live show me and fee. And we'll pick 10 videos where I promoted the giveaway and, and use like a random comment generator and, you know, worldwide, whatever. And also we have our very first exclusive variant comic that we're crowdfunding right now on Indiegogo. It's Vampirella holding a gem in her hand uh, drawn by Ken Hacer. And um, it's already funded. It's going to happen for sure. But I definitely would like to get as much support as possible for the first variant. They have trade dress, virgin, black and white, metal, CGC options and all that. So uh, if you go to Indiegogo or search Gemin Collectibles Indiegogo, it'll pop up. Um, maybe Jimmy will put it in the description for us so you can Absolutely. Uh, and click and, and support the uh, the variant. And yeah, come over to the channel, man. Daily content, kind of a wide variety of things uh, underneath this uh, comic book umbrella. Awesome, man. Dude, thank you so much. I've had an absolute ball. Guys, this is 10 Questions with Gemin Collectibles. Peace.